Den norske Nobelkomiteen har bestemt at Nobels fredspris for 2006 skal deles mellom Mohamed Yunus og Grameen Bank for arbeidet dere for å skape økonomisk og sosial utvikling nedenifra. There is one quotation, and that is from uh, one of the borrowers. She said, my mother gave me birth. Yunus gave me a life. I do think that we need to give Mohammed Yunus credit for spreading the idea that you can do business with the poor. They're not just objects of charity. 35 years ago, Mohammed Yunus founded Grameen Bank, a bank that has dispersed over $8 billion dollars lifting millions of people from poverty with microloans. This idea which began in Jobra has spread around the world. There are now Grameen type program in almost every country in the world. Bill and Hillary Clinton got on the bandwagon. Kings and Queens got on the bandwagon. Bono got on the bandwagon. All these big names, Hollywood stars, left and right, all said, this is wonderful, this is great. And Mr. Dr. Mohammed Yunus wins the Nobel Peace Prize for this. How can it be bad? It must be good. More than a billion of the world's population are living in poverty and separated from the global markets. So why not give the poor loans so that they can start small businesses and improve their lives with so-called microloans? This simple idea and the man behind it have been hailed as a triumph for decades. <laughs> But can a loan of, say, $120 really make a difference? Really help poor families out of poverty? A small village in Bangladesh called Jobra generated the very first apparent success stories in the history of microloans. It was in this village, then, that Mohammed Yunus's successful Grameen Bank first began. In 1976, the young economist Mohammed Yunus lent $27 in total to 42 women in Jobra to help them kickstart a business. If I could make so many people so happy with such a tiny amount of money, why shouldn't I do more of it? We became a bank, call it Grameen Bank or Village Bank. Today that bank is a big bank. It's a nationwide bank in Bangladesh. We have nearly eight and a half million borrowers in that bank. By the mid-90s, the world had learned about the success stories of the microloans in Bangladesh. This little village came to symbolize this success. The former First Lady of the United States, Hillary Clinton, pictured here on tour in the company of the proud Mohammed Yunus. Word about what you have achieved traveled all the way to the United States. Ex-President Bill Clinton is also an enthusiastic supporter. Year after year, since 2001, he has suggested Mohammed Yunus would be a worthy recipient of the Nobel Prize. In the course of Hillary Clinton's visit, numerous families in the village were offered microloans to enable them to build houses. Since then, the village has been nicknamed Hillary Village. Thirteen years after the First Lady's visit, we have gone to see the effects of the proclaimed economical boost. Can I see? Hillary. To some of the villagers, the small microloans have been very useful. 
যে কিছু হইতো ছিল না এখন এই কিস্তির টাকা শোধ করে দিয়ে বাড়ি ঘরদর করেছি ইচ্ছা মতো ছেলে মেয়ে বিয়ে দিয়েছি তারপরে ভালো পড়া যায় ভালো পড়াই সব কিছুই করা যায় তাতে আমার কষ্ট হয় না তারপরে আবার টুকটাক করে তুলে ছাগল গরু পালি আমি ছাগল আছে গরু আছে টাকা গোছাই অনেকগুলো গরু হইলো সেই গরুগুলো বেছে আমার বড় মেয়ে বিয়ে দিলাম অনেক লোকে নিয়েছে আমরা ওই সময় সদস্য ছিলাম ষাট সত্তর জন In Paris, we meet a development researcher with decades of experience in poverty reduction, including work for the World Bank and the United Nations. It almost has a, 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 an irresistible magic to it. And the magic goes like this. You give a little money to a poor person. The poor person invests. He and she make money, and they pay the money back. What could be better than that? A low-cost, if not no-cost investment, and boom, poverty is solved. In New York, we meet an economist who has investigated what access to money can mean for poor people. The great hope for microfinance was that this very focused intervention could reach massive scale worldwide and take millions out of poverty. The ideas are very, very powerful. In Jombra, where it all started, we meet the daughter of Sofia Begum. Her mother was one of the very first loan takers of Mohammed Yunus. In Jobra, the fate of Mrs. Begum was not seen as a success. According to the local media, Sophia Begum died in deep poverty in 1998. During the interview with the daughter, a neighbor suddenly interferes. Back in Hillary Village, we meet Kartik and his family. Members of this family tell us that they got a mortgage and still have a loan from Grameen Bank. Today, Kuda and his family owe about $70 to the bank. A few days after Hillary Clinton's tour, the villagers got a new American visitor. Development researcher Jude Fernando had heard about her visit. I was very curious uh, as to why that the uh, uh, this particular person was uh, the whole Hillary Clinton was brought in. So I went and interviewed the interviewed lots of women. They say that you know, microfinance was not very popular before she came in, and most of the women who spoke during Hillary Clinton's visit were not from the village, and uh, most of the women were. Uh, taken by buses from outside. 
uh, obviously they knew what exactly to say. Uh, so I think for me it was a PR thing. घर बाड़ी बेचे फेले से बिक्री कारो कारो उन्नति क्यों करते क्यों पारि नाई मत चलते Many of the micro credit banks or organizations take their inspiration from Grameen Bank. In Washington, we meet a great admirer of Muhammad Yunus. 13 years ago I started a foundation called Grameen Foundation that was meant to help support organizations that were trying to apply the Grameen principles and a Grameen strategy in other countries because most of the world's poverty is outside of Bangladesh in places like India, Nigeria, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan and so I wanted to help people who were trying to apply what I'd seen work so well in Bangladesh in other contexts. Having access to credit has proven to be powerful. People think about finance all the time, need finance, want finance, and microcredit gives it to them. In London, however, an expert in microfinance describes how microcredit banks use the stories of their accomplishments. The microfinance institutions publicize the tiny number of successes, but what they don't tell us is the much, much larger number of failures. We don't tend to see the bad side of the story. We only get to see the small, uh, the successful side of the story. Grameen Bank's headquarters in Dakar is a material proof of its success. The building is one of the tallest in the capital, and the Western world has contributed enormously to this success. There were a lot of grants that were coming in directly. So I started to see that there were various places where subsidies were coming in. And so over time, in this period that I was looking at in the early 90s and mid 90s, there was about $175 million worth of subsidy that was coming in. And Norway has been one of the most generous contributors. Almost $70 million of taxpayers' money has been donated from the aid agency NORAD to the Nobel Laureate's Grameen Bank. From the Nobel Committee's point of view, it was fighting poverty that was a major thing for us. It was empowerment of women, which was also important. And it was thirdly, also a reach out for dialogue with the, the Muslim world. In Mexico, microcredit is also very common. And across the globe, more than 100 million poor people now have microloans. By virtue of their poverty, they are excluded from normal banks and credits. In Mexico, most loans must be repaid quickly. So to start and run a small business with profit can be hard. Te dan el préstamo a cambio de que les digas que vas a hacer algún negocio. Entonces yo tenía la idea de 
tener pollos, como una granja de pollos, pero no funcionó, porque al principio, para iniciar, sí, pero después ya no, no te alcanza el dinero. Most people in the world are not entrepreneurs. Not all of us can become Bill Gates. Why do we expect that poor people are different? Tú no has, no es de tu entero gusto que tu mamá tenga un crédito. ¿Por qué? Que no les beneficia nada porque lo agarran y al próximo semana tienen que pagar. ¿Qué dice tu mamá cuando tú le dices, mamá, por qué estás en esos créditos? Pues porque dice que la ayuda en el momento, pero ya pasan una semana, 15 días, y ya no sabe de dónde sacar el dinero para... Que en la mañana Ángela, su hija, pues nos dijo que, pues ella siempre le dijo que no se metiera a préstamos, porque no, que muchos problemas. ¿Está usted contenta con haberle hecho caso? ¿O bueno? Sí, 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 porque ella y mi hijo nunca les ha gustado eso, ni de obtener cosas en abonos, porque pues sí traen problemas. After 35 years, not more than 5% of the poor people in the world have become clients of microfinance institutions. Because of this, microfinance promoters say, well, we have 95% left. This is our new market. We must go to these people. They are being left out. I'm arguing that perhaps they're, it's not that they're being left out. It's that they don't want to come to the party. Every week in Mexico, this group of women meet. The weekly payment on the debt is due. Este es un grupo de la colmena que le llamamos la colmena. Cada colmena está formada este, de varios grupos. Son cinco, cinco personas. Hacemos el panal, como se le dice. De Facebook, todas las cosas de virtuales. Y, hay mucha y es que aquí pues hacemos un negocio, recurrimos a la colmena, de ahí pues compramos, por ejemplo, acá está una compañera, de sus recursos se dedica a vender tamales. Acá todas, todas participan. El que no vende tortillas, vende otras, otros productos, tacos en la noche, tortas, pero sí nos ha ayudado mucho. Taking a microloan requires, in most cases, personal savings. No savings, no credit. However, as a group member, it can be a costly affair to act as a guarantor. Dario, porque una compañera no aportó, agarró el crédito y que se va. Era del ismo, no estaba acá. Todas dimos solidarios. Yo ahí tuve como 800 de solidario más mis ahorros, desgraciadamente la quebró la caja, el ahorro ya no nos devolvieron y tuvimos que pagar de esa persona, este, la mamá y la hija. Just as in Mexico, this group of women in Bangladesh meets to make the weekly payment. And if one from the group don't, do not pay, what happens then? Five hundred million rupees. Why do you want to go and loan for a day? Or how many days do you want to do that? Loan until the seventh day. Cut it. One person can do 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 it. One person how do you like for me? Enthusiasm for these microloans is not very high amongst the organizations working to strengthen women's rights in Bangladesh. They use a group as the collateral. So one member of a group's default is the entire default of all the members of that group. That means that group, everybody will lose all their savings.
Most loans must be repaid in less than a year, and the instalments usually start the week after they receive their loan. To keep pace with the weekly instalments, many of the women are forced to go to expensive local loan sharks. আগে তো মানে ভালো ছিল কিন্তু এখন ঋণ এরিয়ে দেখে আবার ফির ওটা আবার আরো বাড়াই দিছে মানে ইন দি এন্ড দে ইউ মে এন্ড আপ গোইং টু দা মানি লেন্ডার হু স্টিল এক্সিস্ট বিকজ মাই কোশ্চেন ইজ ইফ মাইক্রো ফাইন্যান্স ওয়াজ such a positive thing why is it that money lending exists in the villages and the rate of interest has not gone down Here, this is this outside institution who takes your savings and controls your savings, who controls what loans they're going to give you, and insists that you start repaying from week one. Any business, any production cannot start making repayments in seven days. Most people now are taking out microloans in order to repay old loans or to repay microloans to other microfinance institutions. And the poor are gradually becoming trapped in a, a, a web of micro debt. Today, you can take a microloan for education, to build a house, or for general expenses. And there are plenty of poor people. In Bangladesh, more than 80% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. That's around 120 million people. What microfinance is trying to do with, with very little subsidy from the philanthropic sector uh, is trying to provide a, a service on a commercial basis, on a business basis, to give them a better deal. Uh, and I think most MFIs succeed. In fact, if they weren't succeeding, people wouldn't borrow from them. Uh, so that's the best evidence uh, that we have. The market for microcredit in Bangladesh is enormous. Well over 1,000 microbanks and organizations are currently offering microloans. And there is a lot of money to be earned, says an editor-in-chief who has been following the development of microloans in Bangladesh. In, the, in a commercial bank, for example, if you take loan in Bangladesh, you have to say, pay uh, 12 to 13 percent interest and if, if you take a microcredit you have to pay back from this ranges from 40 percent to and in cases 125 percent so microcredit is a big big business one of the world's largest ngos working to fight poverty has chosen not to offer microcredit to the poor you, you go to Dhaka city, you go to any other big cities, you'll find buildings, beautiful buildings, hundreds of thousands of people working for these organizations. This is not a question of right or wrong. Definitely this microfinance can give you a lot of return. But our question is, who should be benefiting from return? Is it the poor people or the organizations who are practicing microfinance? In 2007, a group of economists in Bangladesh undertook a detailed study of the many proclaimed success stories. The study covered some 2,500 people who had taken microloans. More than one-third had loans from Grameen Bank. And we found that most of the people have not added to their asset at all. And there have been many, maybe about a third or more, uh, whose assets in fact uh, went down. And we also found that the health and sanitation situation is not good. There are children going to school, but they are uh, dropping out after a while. And their food intake also has not improved very much. The reason being, they told us, that they have to pay installments every week. 
So the main thing that they were trying to do is to find money to pay the installment, disregarding other needs uh, of the family, because installment has to be paid, otherwise there may be punishment awaiting them or their colleagues, the members of their groups. The study showed that Grameen Bank's annual interest rate is between 26 and 31 percent. Other microcredit banks had even higher rates. The first results when they came, I, I, I didn't believe that. I thought it can't be. Because uh, uh, this is microcredit, it's known all over the world and there's so much praised by everybody. And then the results say that people have not um, done any, any better than that they're remaining either where they are or going back, only few uh, making it good. Bangladesh is not the only country where microcredit has become a profitable business. One of Grameen Foundation's partners is the African microloan bank LAPO in Nigeria. According to the New York Times, the annual interest rate charged by LAPO is more than 100%. In Nigeria, for example, uh, an organization we work with, LAPO, has been criticized. Uh, well, it, as it happens, uh, many Nigerian banks that operate in the rural areas charge twice as much. Uh, rural banks charge twice as much as LAPO. So LAPO is a bargain for them, uh, even though it seems high for, uh, for people seeing it from the outside. At the University of Cambridge, an economic expert has analyzed the facts and figures. They'll never get out of poverty because uh, when you have to pay 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100% interest rate, what business uh, uh, makes that kind of uh, uh, profit? Back in Bangladesh, we interviewed numerous families and got detailed information on how the microloan banks operates in the field. Can you read and write? No. So you don't know what was in the document? Can you read or write, madam? No, I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm not So how do you know what's in the document? I don't know. I'm not sure i we also meet Hasira. She is struggling with a 30% annual interest rate on her loan from Grameen Bank. They go to their houses, collect whatever small little things, including their tin sheds, take that as their pawn or collateral so that they're forced to pay back. It's such a sad reality, but it exists, and it exists to an extent which you can find out quite frequently in this country. Back in Hillary Village, Kartik and his family also have loans at Grameen Bank. The daily production of small bamboo-made tools is the main income for the little family. But often, it's not enough to cover the weekly installments. Mm -hmm. 
কিস্তি চালাতে পারে না তোমার লোন দেয়া হবে না এইসব লোন দেয় না কি করব তখন মানুষের কাছ থেকে হাওলাত বের করে বেড়াতে হয় যে কিছু টাকা দেন আমার আমি কিস্তি চালাতে পারছি না ওকে আবার পরে দিয়ে দেব না কিছু টাকা দেন এইভাবে করি এইরকম সমস্যা যখন হয় তখন আপনার মনে রাগ খুব তৈরি হয় না রাগ রাগ করে কি করব Since its humble beginnings in the 1970s, Grameen Bank has become one of the world's largest microloan banks. And with some 8.5 million Grameen Bank customers, the potential for new business is not lacking. The bank has also established a number of companies including joint ventures with large multinationals. We create a lot of those companies, particularly now we have done it with the multinational companies. like BSF in Germany we have a Grameen BSF company also we do that uh, joint venture with Adidas more than 50 Grameen companies are offering everything from textiles water and yogurt production to health services insurance solar energy and cell phone services Grameen Bank has certainly expanded and it now has 7 or 8 million clients and uh, these clients can be used for all sorts of other activities Grameen Bank continues to grow, continues to work both the credit and savings side and continues to innovate uh to uh contribute the most it possibly can to reducing and in one day eliminating poverty in Bangladesh. The cell phone company Grameen Phone has proved to be a gold mine. The main shareholder is the state-controlled Telenor from Norway. In just 8 years Telenor has nearly earned 60 million dollars of profit. In 1996, Yunus established a new company controlled by himself and named Grameen Kalyan because Mohammed Yunus had a problem. Grameen Bank's tax exemption ended in 1998. It is evident from a variety of documents we managed to obtain never before published many of the documents are written by Muhammad Yunus we can reveal that Yunus discreetly transferred more than 100 million dollars from Grameen Bank to the new company Grameen Kalyan the transfer took place in December 1996 around 100 million dollars of which most came from Norway and other international donors such as Sweden, Germany and Canada were returned after the transfer to Grameen Bank as a loan. In that way, the poor people's bank avoided paying tax. However, in February 1998, the Norwegian embassy in Bangladesh rings the alarm bell. By chance, an employee discovered that more than 100 million dollars had been transferred. The embassy had not even heard of the new company Grameen Kalyan. The Norwegian State Aid Corporation Norad reacts harshly that the funds are missing from the Grameen Bank in order to avoid future taxation, as Mohammed Yunus writes. With gradual higher interest rate charged, more and more money will have to be paid out as taxes in future. Both the aid agency Norad and the Norwegian embassy in Dhaka demanded that Yunus paid back all the money to Grameen Bank. However, and in spite of massive pressure from the Norwegian authorities, only around 30 of the 100 million dollars was returned. In a personal letter to the then director of Norad, Mohammed Yunus warns about the consequences should the matter go public. Dear Tova, I need your help. If the people within an outside government who are not supportive of Grameen get hold of this letter, we'll face real problems in Bangladesh. And Norad kept their mouths shut. They stamped all the documents confidential. The case should be resolved as soon as possible. so that it would not be known we have repeatedly tried to get a comment from those responsible for norad's leadership in 1998 but just 2 hours before a scheduled interview it's been cancelled 
vi havde en aftale i dag klokken 14. We also tried to get interviews with the present leadership of NORAD, but nobody wanted to take part in this documentary. After the documents were released, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs published a report concluding that the donor money from Norway in no way was used for unintended purposes. As said, only less than a third of the 100 million dollars were transferred back to Grameen Bank. What happened to the remaining donor money? One can only guess. The official report from Norway does not give any substantial answer. For decades, microcredit has been seen as an effective tool to lift poor people out of poverty. And the Western world has donated enormous amounts of money for the cause. I mean, people with this uh, goodwill to help uh, developing countries, especially in Scandinavia, have been kind of, <laughs> I'm uh, sorry to use this word, but uh, duped into you know, believing that this is uh, the ideal solution uh, for poverty. In Washington, we meet a development researcher who, for years, has been explaining that microcredit banks only focus on their own success stories. I think Westerners have been lured and misled by the storytelling. On the other hand, it's also partly our fault. Okay? The reason that the microfinance promoters keep, tell keep telling the stories is that they work. Right? We decide who to give money to based on who tells the best story that makes us feel good about where our money is going. We usually don't give our money to the people who have the best scientific evidence that it actually works. If you take a microloan, in most cases, you do not need any collateral. That's how the idea is being sold to us. But group pressure and failed investments in small businesses could have serious consequences for the poor. We went to the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. Here the microcredit market almost exploded in recent years. And just as in Mexico and Bangladesh, the loan takers in India face hard times. <laughs> And Pula's husband is not the only one who took his life. Currently, a string of suicides are being investigated by the authorities in Andhra Pradesh. The MFI sometimes also MFI employees come and uh, comment on the defaulting members. Say, why you are you are not paying this amount? If you are unable to pay, you die. And uh, if you die, we will get the recovery from the insurance company like that. There are instances where such comments are made. And uh, even the uh, joint liability group members also pressurize the women members, the borrowers to sell away the belongings, uh, small jewelry, small items, valuable things. And that is how the borrowed members, they lost the uh, self-respect and uh, hu the humiliation, they are subjected to humiliation and uh, leading towards the family quarrel and ultimately they are succumbing to deaths. The state has passed emergency measures banning loan collectors from making house calls. But that didn't help Rama the mother of a 20-year-old girl. Mission <laughs> 
కావచ్చు వారికి ఎట్లా అర్థమని మేము ఇద్దరం గొడవ పెట్టుకుంటాను గొడవ పెట్టుకుంటా అంటే ఆమె మనసుకి ఏమనుకున్నారా సార్ మేము ఇతర గొడవ పెట్టుకుంటాను ఆమె పోయి కిరసని గ్యాస్లో పోసుకున్నాం సార్ పోసుకొని అంటే పెట్టుకొని ఎంబడే పోయి గొల్లెం పెడితే మేము ఎంబడే ఉరికినాం సార్ ఉరికిన తలుపులు తీయమంటే ఎంత తీయాలా సార్ అసలు అంటే పెట్టుకొని ఆ గొల్లెం తీసి బయటకు వచ్చింది సార్ బయటకు వచ్చి అంతేలా మా అది వాళ్ళందరూ వాడ పక్క వాళ్ళందరూ కూడి ఇనసుత అయ్యో అయ్యా అని పోతే ఈ చేతులు కానీ సార్ ఆయన సుత చేతులు ముఖం ఆయన సుత కాని ఇద్దరిని గాంధీ ఒకరిని తీసుకుపోయాను సార్ తీసుకుపోయి ఆయన ట్రీట్మెంట్తో ఒక పది పన్నెండు రోజులు ఆయన ఉన్నాడు ఈయన మూడు రోజుల వరకు ఆమె Whether we go to India, Mexico or Bangladesh, people tell the same story. Mona is a gadi tale mata diye mori. Era obostha. Ye kishti sala dite basse na shobai eshe saap desse. Tokhon to amar samasya hoye bhai. ঠিক মতো দিতে পারি না তবু কারো বাড়ি করে অনুরোধ করি তবু কিন্তু মানে না কিস্তি <laughs> Microfinance as an industry wants everyone to continue to believe that it's important and useful and therefore deserves subsidy and the generous support of the public. The public isn't interested in hearing the details of this thing. They want to see the smiling face and that's why the smiling face will continue to be there. We don't bother doing evaluations of these things because we don't really want to see that we wasted our money. If you ask them what they really want, they want a stable economy, they want an opportunity to get a job, they want security. They don't want to go out in the hot sun and sell a bag of rice standing next to 20 other people selling the same bag of rice and making pennies a day.
Microloans gave Mohammed Yunus world fame and an international business conglomerate of more than 50 companies. He has been of enormous service to the privileged and the powerful business and economic elites in Western countries. What exactly he's added to the livelihoods of the poor is another issue. 35 years into the microfinance movement, we don't have any clear evidence that microcredit, microfinance more generally, reduces poverty on average. Certainly there are some people who have um, you know, used a loan and started that business and made their lives better, you know, putting their kids through school and so on. But then there are also people who have gotten in trouble. There have been few women who have been able to do that. There may be more people may argue back with me and say, no, it's not a few, maybe it is a thousand women. Maybe it is 5,000 women. So what? What is our population? In the 25 years that I've been examining this phenomenon, that I have been talking to borrowers in, in marketplaces and under trees in Africa and in 25 countries around the world, and I've spoken to thousands, literally thousands of borrowers, um, it was clear to me that this was not having any effect on poverty. We are getting increasing anecdotal evidence, stories, of families that are getting into trouble, of families that are taking on too much debt, of families that are starting to sink as they get more capital and are not able to handle it effectively. People have this uh, notion that, oh, it can you know, transform but, uh, not only individuals' lives by allowing them uh, to become one-person entrepreneurs, but it also transforms uh, the whole economy and uh, makes countries develop. Yeah? Neither of these things have happened. I would strongly disagree with the concept that there isn't academic proof, research proof of the effectiveness of microfinance. In fact, five years ago, Grameen Foundation came out with an article, a uh, paper really, summarizing more than 90 academic studies that have been done on microfinance, uh, showing uh, sustained impact of most of the MFIs on poverty and other human development indicators. For months, we have tried to get an interview with Mohammed Yunus in order to get some answers to the many critical points raised in this program. We finally tracked Mohammed Yunus to a business fair in Valencia in Spain, where he is receiving yet another award. I've sent him the question six weeks ago, and I've kept on doing this week after week after week. Send also it, to Lamia. Send, yeah. send it to me, and I will take care. We arranged, we arranged, and then we send it on the right spot. Just, he doesn't want to do it today. Let's uh, see a good time. When, when will I get that? We have repeatedly forwarded our questions and put forward the criticisms of Grameen Bank. But neither Grameen Bank nor Mohammed Yunus wants to participate in this program. However, in a brief email, Grameen Bank explains that they were not trying to avoid taxation in the case of the transfer of the $100 million. A fact that totally contradicts what Mohammed Yunus personally wrote in several letters. In the email from August 2010, Grameen Bank also says they have never been liable for taxation in Bangladesh. But four months later, Mohammed Yunus stated that all the money had been transferred back and that the transfer was done out of tax reasons. After the many secret documents were released in the press, Grameen Bank has issued a statement where they claim that some of these newspaper articles are false and fabricated. In December 2007, we met Jahanara, a woman who recently sold her house to pay her debts. Uh, 
তারপরে বেড়া করতে গেছি আর পোশাক করতে গেছি 11 মিনিট থেকে 7000 টাকা করে দিছি কতদিন আগে নিছি নিছি পরে বছর হইছে এখন কি অবস্থা এখন অবস্থা কি এখন একটু মানে এত দিন তো সবাই লোকজনে আমারে হামলা করছে আমার থেকে টাকা পয়সা নিয়ে নেওয়ার জন্য রাতের দিনে সমানে আসছে এখন দেখতাছে তারা অবিরক্ত হয়ে গেছে তারা মানে অসুস্থ হয়ে গেছে এখন দিতে পারতাছে না বুঝতাছে যে আমার ঘরের যা যা ছিল সব আমি বিক্রি করে ফলাইছি বিক্রি করে আমার ঋণ শোধ হইতাছে না We are now trapped in that development model and it's going to be very difficult for us to accept that we've made a mistake the last 30 years and move on to a model where we give people sufficient resources to actually set up some sort of income generating activity a business to get themselves out of poverty rather than give them a tiny amount of money which basically just gets them into further debt More than 2 years after we first met Jahanara we go back লামে আনিয়া কষ্ট থাকছি কষ্ট খাইছি একটা বিপদে পড়া গেছি ভালো মন্দ খাইতে পারি নাই বা আমরাও খাইতে পারি নাই বা এক বেলা খাইছি আর এক বেলা খাই নাই এই সারা আমি জিতে পাব না কেন আমার তো জায়গা নাই সম্পত্তি নাই যে আমি বিক্রি করে দিয়া দিব এখন দেন না কি অবস্থা থাকি বস্তিতে বস্তির মত থাকি আমার বাড়ি ঘর ছিল কেমন আছে কেমন কষ্ট করুন দিকে কষ্ট লেগে বাপে এই যে বাড়ি ঘর দিয়ে গেছিল দুনিয়া তো এতিম এতিমের দিকে কে তাকাইব কে দেখবো আল্লাহ সারা We also return to a little village in the northern part of Bangladesh. Here we meet Razia and her daughter. Razia also has loans with Grameen Bank. She wanted to give her daughter an education. I'm to dite parchi na 500 taka pura. Kotha thake dibo? Er age chilo je gula er age ami beshi enjoy korte chilam. So, um you just told me that you had to sell your house. Can you show me your house? Apni ki oi যে বাড়িটা আগে ছিল আপনার ওই বাড়িটা ওনাকে দেখা দিতে পারবেন হ্যাঁ পারবো লেটস গো চলো সো রাশিয়া হাউ ফর হাউ লং টাইম ডিড ইউ হ্যাভ দ্যাট হাউস ইউ হ্যাড টু সেল 15 15 বছর 15 ইয়ার্স 15 ইয়ার্স ইউ বিল্ড ইট ইয়ারসেলফ ইওর ফ্যামিলি নিজেরাই তৈরি করছিলেন হ্যাঁ নিজেরাই তৈরি করছিলাম জায়গা কিনে নিজেরাই তৈরি করছিলাম হ্যাঁ এটা আমার পুরনো বাড়ি আমি বললাম তাহলে নিচ্ছেন কি জন্য If you think back, do you sometimes feel that you should never have taken the very first loan? Yeah, I loan na ni le to amar bari bikri korte hoyto na. Ami to loan er taka niya bari kori nei. And now it has become a never ending story to you and your family. Ekhon to mone hocche je eta ar kokhono shesh hobe na. Loan ar kokhono loan theke ber hoyte parben na. Ei to ashi koi ber hoyte parchi parchi na to chesta to korte chi ber howar jonno kintu parchi na to. তখন না পারি কিস্তি তে বাইরে হইতে পারি না কিস্তি চালাইতেও পারি না বাড়ি হই বাড়ি বিক্রি করতে হচ্ছে আমার এনজিওরা তো মানতেছে না তারা তো আসি হোম কি দেখাচ্ছে বাসায় আসি বসে থাকেছে কি মাল বিক্রি করবেন করেন না লে তিন দিন তিন বিক্রি করে শুধু এক চালাইছে আমি গ্রামীণ হ্যাজ গিভেন মি অ্যান আনশেকেবল ফেথ in the creativity of human beings this has led me to believe that human beings are not born to suffer the misery of hunger and poverty i firmly believe that we can create a poverty free world if we collectively believe in it muhammad yunus said that credit is a human right but he never said that debt is a human right but the other side of credit is debt every time you take a credit you are in debt poor people don't like debt any more than you and I do. In a poverty-free world, the only place you would be able to see poverty is in the poverty museums. Poverty is a matter of time. You're not going to solve the problems of the poorest countries in five years, ten years, thirty years, forty years. 
There's no real business development potential. There's no real escape from poverty. Um, that's the end of the story. It looks extremely sexy and nice to have this one woman story from rags to riches, but it's also a cause for a lot of exploitation. The way we are operating microfinance across the globe, it is not sustainable. It is really banking on the, on the hard-earned money on the poorest of the poor. It is only throwing poor people into further poverty. We need to take more time and do better homework and do more research. Until we begin to do that, we won't come up with more interesting and creative solutions to, to, to some of these problems.